Well, it's, it's my very great pleasure to be able to introduce <coughs> Hans Kamp. Hans Kamp was at UCLA in the late in the in the mid to late 1960s. Prior, in fact, does mention his work on now, and I think that he and Frank Gluck I regard as the inventors of what was called double indexing or as uh, two-dimensional semantics, the thing that some Australians seem to think they invented this century. But the, um, so we are, in fact, back to the days of Pryor himself, and so it's a great delight for me to have um, Hans come and talking to us on priori intense logic, hence predicate logic, and many sorted predicate logic. Thank you, and I'd like to thank the organisers for having made it possible for me to be here. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to miss this occasion for anything, uh, if only because of there's so much that I owe to prior. Uh, by the way, I was just hung with this object. Does that do any good? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Let me start, although tonight there is a special session for this, with a few personal remarks, but they will be short and lead into the more substantive things I'd like to say. <coughs> um, I knew already something about tense logic at the time when I went, it was my first really large trip, the first large one across the Atlantic Ocean, um, to become a graduate student at... Uh, in the philosophy department at UCLA, uh, I knew already something about tense logic and had certainly also heard Pryor's name and read a couple of things by him. <coughs> but it was nevertheless a complete surprise uh, when I arrived there in September of uh, 1965 that he was actually that very first semester I would be there, the uh, visiting, the Flint visiting professor in uh, philosophy. And he offered a course, an upper division undergraduate course, in tense logic, which I took, and which I immensely enjoyed, and which uh, became, <coughs> well, one of the issues discussed there became uh, the topic of my dissertation. I switched, I'd come with an other <coughs> interest, and I abandoned that, not because I wasn't making any progress, but <coughs> because this uh, new topic actually fascinated me a great deal more. It had to do with how you can use a basically topological, tense logical system like Prior's PF calculus to introduce some kind of notion of metric time. And I'm coming back to that in uh, later on in this talk. Um, so that's all I want to say for now about uh, well, not quite about the personal interactions, at least at UCLA. Uh, after uh, that first term, the Priors went back to England, but Prior uh, uh, and I remained in contact, and he invited me to Oxford a number of times in the following years. Um, uh, we even travelled together in the late summer of, thank you, of um, 69 from Oxford to a conference in Oberwolfach in the south of Germany and from there he went on to give the lectures in Norway and it was during that tour that he then died. So the last time I saw him was when we said goodbye to each other in this place, Oberwolfach in uh, Germany, uh, I learned about his death only quite a bit later, I think it was two or three weeks later, and it was a shed with everybody else. When uh, Pryor came to UCLA, uh, some of us have just heard a talk on this very topic, but some of you haven't, um, he um, came into a community where tense logic had become um, a subject for investigation by model theoretic means. In particular, Nino Cocciarella, a student of Montague, had just finished his dissertation. He had already left Los Angeles and taken up a post in San Francisco. And his dissertation was examined during the time that Pryor was 
in uh, Los Angeles at UCLA. And that one piece was the sort of demonstration of the kind of model theoretic methods that had first been developed by Kripke uh, in application to modal logic and now also had become established as a way of dealing with problems in the domain of tense logic. Now, I don't think that Pryor ever really seriously adopted the model theoretic uh, method in his own work. Um, Partly that might have been because there wasn't all that much time between this time he first sort of came into close contact with it and the time he died, but I think there may also be another reason, and that is that there is something about the model theoretic cement, uh, method that, um, if I am right, is not really entirely in line with his own philosophical conceptions and the particular role the tense logic played within those. And the first part of the talk will actually about uh, trying to elaborate that thought and in doing so I'll concentrate on a paper that's already been mentioned a number of times in this conference as quite central in an appreciation of uh, Pryor's work, namely this paper Tense Logic and the Logic of Earlier and Later. Um, sorry, I'm switching a few of the slides. So um, the logic of earlier and later, I abbreviated this LEL, um, does, in a way I'm going to explain, for Prior's PF calculus, and I'm, the PF calculus I'm talking about is just propositional logic with the classical connectives and these two tense operators, P for course the case that, and F for it will be the case that. Um, there is a sense in which what Pryor does in this paper and what he does with this logic of earlier and later that is quite similar, I'd like to contend, to what one can accomplish with the model theoretic method that uh, Boccherella applied to tense predicate logic in his dissertation. And what Boccherella does in the dissertation also applies by implication to propositional logic. The difference between propositional tense logic and tense predicate logic will become quite important later on, and I hope we'll get there um, before it's too late. Um, now, inasmuch as you can achieve similar results, similar explanations by the model theoretic method that Cocteau, and others were beginning to apply uh, to tense logic on the one hand and the means that uh, prior uses in uh, tense logic and the logic of earlier and later you compare these methods uh, one thing that strikes at least the logician's eye is that the means that prior uses are much more modest carry much less of a logical and ontological commitment than one nilly-willy has to make when one applies the model theoretic method in the way that uh, Cocteau and others uh, are doing. So, um, in a way, you can think of the result that you find in particular in this prior paper as a way of uh, converting or unfolding a formula of tense logic into a statement uh, using what look like more conventional or predicate logical means uh, of the conditions under which it is true at a particular time. This is what model theory does explicitly uh, and I'm not going into the details of how it's done there but uh, it's something that you can also do by proof theoretic methods and then it's a kind of unfolding I already used the term of the formula for which you want to get 
uh, an explicit statement of the truth conditions. A statement you might also want to say is actually sort of conceived of as part of the B theory as opposed to the A theory, uh, exemplified by the formulas of the PF calculus. So, um, the PF calculus, I already described it, is just uh, sort of ordinary propositional logic with P and F. Um, and now, the logic of earlier and later, as I define it here, and I should say, as a kind of warning, the reconstruction that I'm going to give you of what's in this paper by Pryor is, to some extent, personalized. Uh, I, he doesn't put things quite the same way as I will be doing. I'm putting things the way in which I am going to put them in order to bring out a particular feature, the feature I was already talking about, uh, of the accomplishment of the paper, of at least one feature. And so I will actually emphasize something, a different aspect of the paper than the one that Patrick yesterday uh, emphasized when he uh, made the connection between the logic of earlier and later, or this paper, uh, sorry, the logic of earlier and later, and hybrid logic. That is in there in a way also, but it's something that I will not uh, be talking about explicitly. And, uh, well, if, if you think the paper can't be interpreted in both these two ways at the same time, that's something for the discussion. Um, so the logic of earlier and later in this narrow sense, uh, you can think of in more traditional sort of logician's terms as a two-sort of first sort of predicate logic, uh, which has two sorts two sorts of objects. The one I call this sort is sentence letters and the other is variables. Uh, sorry, so there are two sorts. It's the, the sentence um, a sentence letter sort for the moment uh, with these letters PQR and then the terms of sort two are uh, an infinite set of variables and one constant T0 which I use to denote some particular time you can think of as the, at the now or the utterance time. And then there are two, two place predicates uh, at relates, it's of this type, sort one, sort two, it relates a sentence letter to begin with to a time and it means that the, the proposition expressed by the sentence letter is true at that time and then there's the relation of precedence between times so it's uh, between two time terms terms of sort two um, and um, now we can extend um, what you get by way of formulas of this uh, logic of earlier later as I just defined it by incorporating the PF calculus into it, the first step, I'll do it in one step or in more steps, I've done it in two steps here, the first step would be to say, well, this first argument place of the ad predicate is not only accessible to sentence letters, but also to complex formulas of the um, 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 PF calculus. So we have just an ordinary uh, classical conjunctions, first argument, here we've got the formula, it was the case that P and it would be the case that not Q as first argument of T, and um, here we've got another example of the same sort. The next extension of what we've got in this way is by actually identifying formulas with terms of sort one altogether. So that means that not only do we get this sort of argument, in, uh, uh, as first argument of that, you also can get a formula of the form at p t prime as first argument of this outer at, and um, so by doing this, we actually get a fairly powerful logical system, which um, incorporates uh, the p f calculus in that. Well, so we have now both these. This is a term, I already classified this as a term of sort one. It's also a formula, so it can occur on its own, or um, 
like, like the P, and then it can be conjoined here with an add formula, and here we've got this tense logical formula as the antecedent of a conditional, and what you've got as consequent is something quite complicated. It doesn't really matter exactly what these formulas say, uh, but it's just to give you an idea of what the expressive uh, resources of this incorporated language are, this, this extended language are, and um, the, the point of one of the central results of uh, uh, tense logic and the logic of early and later can now be stated uh, given this framework as a kind of normal form theorem for this extended language um, and it is a normal form theorem in the following sense for every formula or sentence close formula of this language um, we can actually find an equivalent formula which is of a special form and roughly speaking that's just a formula of sentence plus formula of this original uh, LEL as I defined it, this language of earlier and later so it's, at, well with some further restrictions, namely that quantification over times is always restricted to uh, constraints involving the less than relation as explained here so uh, extensional quantifiers either come in this form there is a T before a given time tau or uh, in the form from the, there's a form of there is a time later than that uh, tau and similarly for the universal quantification so this is a restricted set even of the original my original characterization of the language of earlier and later and uh, the formulas so and also important is that uh, yeah, as I already said actually uh, now again in these restricted formulas the first argument of S can only be occupied by a sentence letter so these are actually the formulas that intuitively spell out the truth conditions of simple and complex formulas of the PF calculus and to prove this normal form theorem, that is to show that for every formula of the calculus at all, and by implication, for every formula of the PF calculus, there is a corresponding normal form which states in this way what its truth conditions are. You, to prove that, you can actually proceed, and that's the way in which Prior does proceed, by deriving the normal form of a given formula of the PF calculus uh, proof theoretically on the basis of a certain set of axioms and rules and then uh, this same set of axioms and rules also allows you to go back from the normal form to the original formula of which it is not the logical form to show that you are equivalent, equivalent. and um, yeah so um, I've listed on the slides the various kinds of axioms that one needs. This is not a complete list, uh, but I want to give you a kind of flavor for those who haven't actually sort of this prior paper very much uh, uh, in the front of their minds, what sort of axioms and rules are necessary. So I'm going to start oops, sorry, with a um, set of axioms for classical propositional logic. We have some set of axioms for the PF calculus, uh, uh, what's needed is a sort of minimal axiomatization of the PF calculus that doesn't really uh, assume more than that time is transitive and that uh, <laughs> X is before Y is the, 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 the two accessibility relations, X is before Y and X is after Y, that they are each other's converse. Um, and then uh, we need um, a, uh, for an axiom that says that uh, if you have a closed formula uh, then that's equivalent to saying that, that it's true at the utmost time t0 here there are the natural clauses that relate p and f uh, to at and uh, earlier then these are 
very much like it. It's basically the, the truth clauses for P and F in a moral theoretical approach, <coughs> because I said there's axioms here, and then there are some further axioms needed uh, to deal with, uh, to manipulate these complex F predications, where, for instance, you have an S uh, pre, uh, formula occurring within the scope of another F formula, and so forth. I don't want to actually go into these details, they're all in the literature. Um, and uh, I'm not going to do any derivations anyway, so there's a point. But, so the, the claim is that with an action system uh, of this kind, it's possible, and the, the rules of modus ponens, and from phi, you can infer that h phi, and um, uh, from phi, you can infer g phi, uh, it will always be the case, and it was always the case. It's upside down. Um, and the, the usual machinery that you also need for, for a predicate logic, you can actually derive uh, the normal form, a normal form for each of the formulas of the F calculus, and thereby sort of show purely proof theoretically that there is a sense, as long as you accept this embedding of the PF calculus in this larger calculus, of each formula of tense logic of the PF calculus kind of carrying within itself its own truth conditions as spelled out in these normal forms. Um, right, so now one important issue that arises also already in connection with this result is how it might scale up to a system of tense predicate logic. So where we replace the PF calculus by a system uh, which has, say, P and F, <coughs> as well as the whole uh, machinery of predicate logic already in that calculus. So this is a general question. Can this result be scaled up to predicate logic? Uh, and I will contemplate... Uh, we will consider in a moment a, a couple of other results where a similar issue, namely a scaling up the predicate logic, also arises. Um, so, the issue then here is go, oops, sorry, it's going to be very much um, how important, from the point of view of this kind and other, full results within tense logic is the difference between propositional tense logic and tense predicate logic. Now, one issue that one has to face, and it's technically moderately difficult, and conceptually very demanding, I think, it's an issue that arises also in modal predicate logic, and the issues are not quite the same, but it's the issue where whether what existed one time also existed in another time, or whether you can, even if it doesn't exist, you can talk about it in relation to that other time, this question of uh, non-constant domains in uh, modal and uh, intense logic. And so in the case of tense logic, it's the issue, what do you do with individuals that existed sometimes, but not with others? That is a problem in its own right, and it makes uh, the whole question that I'm are going to discuss from now on even more complicated than it is, but I want to set that aside for the purpose of this talk and make the simplifying assumption that uh, our domains are constant, that is, the individual domains are constant. So, uh, uh, if you think in more theoretic terms, it means that uh, they have got one single domain of individuals, and those uh, individuals or that domain counts as the domain of each of the times of the model. Even if we make that assumption, which is in this very crude form not particularly plausible, um, we still have various interesting questions to discuss about the relation between propositional tense logic and tense predicate logic, and uh, that's what it'll now be about. Um, so we can skip this. Um, one important question that arises in tense logic, and especially in connection with its applications, is exactly what kind of temporal relations can you express, say, in a system like the PF calculus? Now, that some operators that are not there as primitives, not P and F themselves, can be expressed as clear and the, the, the perhaps 
most famous examples that anybody sort of takes for granted. In fact, how they operate, it will always be the case that H, and it will always be the case that that can simply be expressed as the duals of it was the case that, and it will be the case that. That's a very simple example. There are lots of much more complicated temporal relations to temporal operators of one or more, or two or three or more places that you can express in this calculus. Uh, by means of formulas using the primitive operators in the way that this is a, a definition or a simulation of H phi and so forth. But there are also lots of op, uh, operators that you can easily conceive of or define formally and that you cannot express in the PF calculus. One example is this operator P prime, uh, where P prime phi says at a given time that phi is true in the past at points arbitrarily close to where you are. Now, that's perhaps an operator that's not entirely natural from the point of view of natural language, I don't know, but uh, it's certainly something that you can define formally, and you can prove that that's not expressible within the PF calculus. <coughs> now, if you want a more powerful tense logic that has the same operator like P prime and it's dual F prime, you can, of course, throw those in and then uh, either sort of state the truth conditions of those, or add additional axioms involving these new operators, uh, relating them to themselves and each other and to the original tense operators, uh, or do both and, and, and they get a complete result. Um, but, and you might then think, okay, well, okay, I, I just avail myself of the operators I need for various purposes as things arise, but in principle, having built uh, 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 an extension of the PF calculus with a finite number of other such operators, uh, I probably might need some more operators at a later stage. Well, if that comes, I'll throw those in. But so the idea that you would have a kind of infinite hierarchy of ever more powerful, uh, more expressing, uh, expressible expressively more powerful uh, extensions of PF is actually a rather natural one. And one rather surprising result was that um, actually this is, in an important sense, not true. You can reach the limit quite quickly, uh, and in fact in one go, by introducing um, two-place tense operators. So this is since phi psi means uh, from your side. So here I am, this is psi phi of S phi psi is true here, if there's a point in the past where phi is true and psi is true at all the intermediate points, and similarly the, the mirror image operation until phi psi says there's some time in the future where phi is true and uh, throughout the interval from now to then uh, psi is true. Those two operators actually have the property that if you just built a PF-like calculus with uh, those as primitives rather than uh, as then the PF, you get that that, that that system is functional, functionally complete in the sense that any tense operator of a certain kind, and I'll say what that kind is, that you might come up with is already expressible in the system. Now, as I state the result, uh, it has to be somewhat constrained. Uh, uh, it's not as generally true as I've said it is, we must assume that time is linear and also that it's continuous in the sense of the uh, instant structure being closed under limits, but then this SU calculus is complete in the sense that uh, every tense operator that can be uh, topologically defined uh, and since I over here already have the machinery of the the logic of earlier and later, I can actually state it in with the help of that language. Any operator that can be defined uh, within LEL by one of these restricted formulas that I talked about earlier, and we talked about normal forms. If you take such a restricted formula and it contains only sentence letters, say from P1 up to Pn, in, a, in, a, in an ordering of the, of the sentence letters then that can be considered as a definition, a semantic definition of a kind of a new operator, an operator O such that O P1 up to Pn is true uh, at a given time, just in case that defining formula is. Any 
operator that can be characterized by such a restricted formula of the LEL of LEL is that's the theorem uh, expressible with the help of sense and until so long as uh, time is continuous you can even get rid of the assumption of continuity this is a result by old result by Jonathan Starvey uh, uh, if you add in addition to S and U two additional operators that sort of fill the gap in a sort of literal sense that the uh, operators as and you leave for cases of non-continuous time um, and uh, for the sake of the argument here I'd like uh, to state this result also it's just a matter of reformulation as a normal form theorem a normal form theorem for this SU calculus and well I mean this is just saying the same thing that I already said uh, the theorem basically is to the effect that if I built uh, a, 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 a tense logic with these operators S and U and one or more of those operators that can be semantically defined uh, in the way just indicated with these LEL formulas then that extended formula uh, system sorry, uh, is no more powerful than the system just with S and U in other words, if I take a formula of the extended logic, there will be a normal form for it, which is a formula in which S and U may occur, but none of the other operators, A1, uh, O1, O2, etc. So, here we may again or ask, I didn't actually ask the question properly in the case uh, of um, of Prior's normal form result that I mentioned before um, does the result scale up to tense predicate logic? Now in the case of the Prior theorem the answer is yes again if we make our, our lives our life easy by assuming uh, constancy of individual domains uh, this is something I didn't really go into uh, but actually when you see how the conversion into normal forms goes, it's not really surprising that it should be so. Um, a similar question can be asked here. Um, I've stated this result uh, of uh, expressive completeness for a system of propositional logic. I can also build a tense pretty good logic in the spirit of Copyright I say, now using S and U as tensor operators in lieu of P and F is this possibility of expressing uh, any of these new operators in terms of S and U still true, that is is it still true that if I take a formula of a tense predicate logic with S, U and some of these other operators there is an equivalent to that formula in the tense predicate logic which only has S and U but not those other operators and the answer again is true if you look at the way in which the result is proved for propositional tense logic the propositional as you calculus you can see quite easily that it sort of automatically scales up in the case of predicate logic I can't uh, because of lack of time go into the details there but that is the situation and I want um, um, let's skip this uh, uh, go straight to the how much over time am I? You've got 10 minutes all told all told right okay so in, I really make it very short so the other result that I wanted to mention uh, is also one that has been mentioned a number of times already this is a treatment of, of now as a one place uh, sentence operator so syntactically on a par with P and F uh, with this um, well, let's see where is it uh, there uh, with this double indexing semantics according to which a formula of the form n phi evaluated at a time t while part of an utterance made at a time another time t prime is true uh, if and only if phi itself is true at that 
utterance time t prime that you have remember the second index in this way of doing the, the Moore's Zero semantics. Um, here too we have on the one hand the result like the two scratch it two. Here we have the result um, that if we take tense propositional logic uh, say with P and F but it's also true for S and U and a whole lot of other systems and you add N then that addition is in a sense redundant that is every formula of the calculus containing N is equivalent uh, logically equivalent to one without N so another normal form theorem if you like add N to your system get the stronger system um, take any formula of the, of, the, of the extended system there is a normal form uh, which is now a formula that doesn't contain any is this result upscalable to predicate logic well the answer is no and actually it's not all that easy to show uh, this is all in a paper of mine that I think has also been mentioned a couple of times it's called the formal properties of now and it was actually um, it's dedicated to prior it was meant to appear in a special volume of Theoria uh, all this papers dedicated to him I was too late so it appeared in the next issue but it is no less dedicated to him um, and so it also contains a proof that here we don't have upscaling from the case for propositional logic to the case for predicate logic uh, and the proof is quite complicated and I to conclude would actually like to make a comment on that paper that should have been in the paper itself I don't think it is uh, but um, it has to do with well, the way in which the paper is set up so these sentences also have already been mentioned or something very much like that um, uh, they were as a way of introducing the idea that now really plays an important role or might be taken to have played an important role in the formalization of natural language and so this sentence the uh, child was born that would be a ruler of the world is contrasted there with uh, either of the following two sentences a child was born that will be ruler of the world and a child was born that would be ruler of the world now uh, this sentence can be formalized in a system of tense predicate with P and F without any difficulty uh, but this one seems different because here this actually says that this from the point of view of the time of birth future time at which this child was going to be ruler of the world is the utterance time and here we've got actually something very much like that the uh, future tense here as opposed to the future of the past in, in one uh, implies that the time at which the child that was born in the past uh, is to be a ruler in the world is going to be in the f should be in the future of now and so two and three then were supposed to be sentences that uh, a natural formalization of which requires uh, the use of n this is the formalization of um, of three were um, uh, here so you've got the, 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 the past of the birth pass operator at the, on the outside and then you've got this extensive quantification over some X being being born and then it says it will be in the case in the future of that earlier uh, birth date that um, uh, it's now the case that uh, this uh, individual is the ruler of the world and that has the effect of requiring this X to be ruler of the world now rather than in some arbitrary time in the future of this uh, birth time the point I want to make is that this although this is a natural reason for wanting to have n in your calculus as a natural uh, as giving you a natural way of formalizing these sentences these are actually not examples I mean this formula and the symbolization for two they're not examples of sentences from which n cannot be eliminated in fact you can rewrite this formula on the last slide as in here um, 
saying that there is somebody who is ruler of the world and there was some time in the past where the axe was born and the child. It feels that it is not the right formalization, but that only has to do with the fact that this word in the original English sentence really has this element of prospectivity, which in the kind of tense logic we're talking about is actually eliminated. For better or worse, but, but that's how these systems all work. So this is actually uh, an, an, um, uh, the normal form, or a normal form, for the, the sentence we just, or the formula we just saw. And um, the question actually finding a, a sort of intuitively natural sentence involving N in predicate logic, which cannot be reduced, it's actually not very easy, and it's not really straightforward at all to extract it from the way in which this result is proved. Now, so as a final word, um, this question of the tension between predicate logic, tense predicate logic, and, 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 and propositional tense logic is something that I think uh, still requires thinking even today, partly because of this thing I set aside having to do with constancy or non constancy of domains, but also in connection with sort of more tactical issues that are responsible for the fact that in the one case, or the two cases I mentioned, uh, you get upscaling into predicate logic, and in this third case, you don't. Um, I would have very much liked to know what Pryor would have thought about the philosophical implications of any of these results. But unfortunately, that wasn't time. Thank you. I, I certainly sympathize with all of us who have struggled with Hans's paper on this, and uh, that it is one of the classics. Uh, we have some time for questions. Um, thank you. That, that was very interesting. Could I? Um, I also like the way that you're talking about this paper, and in particular the way that you're talking about uh, the stage two. What I mean is, this is a very important paper. The way in which I define the extension to Valley you mean? Yes. Um, in particular, um, I agree with you, and this is also interesting even from the point of view of hybrid logic, that the big move that Prior makes in that paper is at what he calls stage two, where he allows you to iterate the at operator. And in fact, he sort of says to the reader, this for some of you is perhaps the step that should not be taken. Now, precisely because now you have, so to speak, terms inside this first order language in a way which you don't have in, so to speak, the correspondence unembedded version. Now then, the comment that you made was, here we are able to express the clauses of the Kripke satisfaction definition and you give the normal, you give the normal form story. I'm in total agreement, but there's, let me be Johan von Bentham yeah. for a yeah. while. Yeah. The other way of looking at it is, now that you have a first order language which contains terms in which you have internalized the correspondence theory, and so, essentially, you are now driving the correspondence theories. So you're telling a story in terms of, say, completeness, of, but you can tell a nice correspondence translation, Johan von Bentham style story, precisely because of the way that you embed at with an ad. One last comment. There's also, maybe, you didn't mention hybrid logic, but there's one thing I like about this as well. I think Prime may also have liked this thing about embedding at within at, because when it comes time at stage three to introduce the nominals, he says, it's trivial now. All we need to do is rethink what these indexes are. They're not names of instance, they're just proposition. Yeah. So he's smuggled in nominals without having to say what they are through the back door. Yeah. He's not doing from the ground up, he's just coming down. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm in, total agreement. I'm in total agreement with you, but I think... Uh, yeah. Read I think you can also read the correspondence right. theory. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that, that allows me <laughs> to say is that if you look at it the way you just explained, then, of course, these formulas of the correspondence logic, if you put it that, yes. they have their own logic and their own model theory, and we have learned a very great deal about them and therefore also about the corresponding tense logic or whatever. I've got a uh, story, sorry, Christian, study. just to add to this, this embedded language, you're calling it, say, the embedded correspondence language. Now, I think, but it's a long time since I've read it, I think that this stage two language was actually the language picked up by Resha and Urquhart in their book Topological Logic. But I'm not quite, but I'm pretty sure, though, that what they call topological language is the stage two version, the embedded version of prize UT calculus. But maybe you could. I can't remember. Great. But I think that's really worth it. Kit has a question, and that'll have to be all, because we are. 
just a question about what's, what's been done. Um, <coughs> on one theoretic account, I say of PF calculus, you can, the standard thing you do is prove completeness. Now, there is a proof theoretic counterpart to that, which is that when you extend the PF calculus, this talk of earlier later and so on, uh, to prove that that's a, a conservative extension, let's suppose you have some standard accent. Uh, and that actually would correspond to the completeness proof. The fact you could prove the completeness proof from it, assuming completeness of the of predicate logic. Uh, uh, and I wonder if people have done that, um, because in a way that's uh, uh, a, a better result than the actual, um, uh, stronger result than the actual, well, it's not actually say stronger, but it, it's, it, uh, <coughs> uh, it, in some ways it gives you more information. So than the prior the result. Huh? Than the prior result, you mean? The, 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 the conservativity result. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, the other way around. I, I, I would hope through that by purely proof theoretic means as well, not, not by some fancy model theoretic argument. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and I just yeah. wondered if anyone has done that, if that's something that people have... I, I assume, I don't, I don't know how, even know how difficult it is, but... Uh, yeah, you mean for, for tense predicate logic, or...? Well, for but either, for either. Um, I, I mean, okay, so... I think that what Pryor suggests, and he makes it very plausible, is that you can, in, in the terminology I use, derive these normal forms for each of the formulas of the PF calculus. Now, a proof that that can be done, of course, involves more. That will require some kinds of induction on the complexity, I take it, of the, of the formulas of the object language, the PF calculus. No, I'm talking about a different result. Oh, sorry, which, which are you talking about? I'm talking about that you take the PF calculus, let's say, um, with the minimum, you know, six yeah, yeah, is the, the, K, the minimum. KT, so yeah, yeah. Minimal and then you in, embed it in this extended language where yeah. you also talk about the early later and so on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I'm talking about a result of a conservativity result, saying there are no more things you can prove within the PF calculus than you could prove before. That's, that's the result, which corresponds to the right. And I was just wondering whether that had been... I see. Um, and also you can, try to try, you can try to prove it for extensions of the PFL. Right, which goes right, on right, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so and also trying to prove that result by purely... You can easily prove it yeah. by model theoretic means. Yes, exactly. But, yeah, 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 that's just yeah, the, yeah. but whether, just using proof theoretic means. Yeah, and that will depend quite essentially on what the axioms and rules are. It will, it will yeah, indeed, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.